Sorry. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for coming this evening to listen to us. Um, I always put a lot of academic references behind my slides. They're on my website, forward slash APPG. I will also put up these slides over the next 24 hours, because I do appreciate at the back they may be quite difficult to see, although you'll be pleased to know there are pictures and not words. We seem to have forgotten why we eat, and we eat because there are certain things that we must consume, otherwise we get seriously sick, if not die. And we need to eat things that we know as macronutrients and micronutrients. Now the macronutrients we know as carbohydrate, protein and fat. And there are essential fats and there are essential proteins. And in nutrition, the word essential means something that we must consume. The body doesn't make it. There is no essential carbohydrate. This is a statement from an American public body, the Panel on Macronutrients, the lower limit of dietary carbohydrate is apparently zero, provided that enough fat and protein are consumed. That is not a contentious statement, that is a nutritional fact. Micronutrients we know as vitamins and minerals. There are 13 vitamins that we must consume and approximately 16 minerals likewise. Another interesting nutritional fact is that protein tends to be approximately 15% of any natural diet. So you might then think that a balanced diet would have fat and carbohydrate making up the rest of the pie, excuse the pun. But of course we put in a requirement that we should have no more than 30% of our calorie intake in the form of total fat. And the minute you set that restriction, you have by definition made the pie to make up of 55% carbohydrate. And in case that wasn't worked out, that statement there, increase your carbohydrate consumption to at least 55 to 60% of your calorie intake, that was a mandate in the 1977 American guidelines set by Senator George McGovern. So this was the focus of my PhD. I spent four years studying at PhD level and many years before that, fascinated by why we would set that restriction. And we set it in the name of heart disease. We believed that dietary fat caused heart disease. We still do believe that dietary fat causes heart disease. I wanted to look at the evidence base for that claim. It also made no sense to me that dietary fat would cause heart disease. Because if you go back to why we eat, why would Mother Nature put the essential fats, the complete proteins, and all the vitamins and minerals in the same food that is then trying to kill us? It just makes no sense. So why do we have so much carbohydrate? Because we demonized fat. Now some of you may remember these headlines from February 2015, the Guardian, the Telegraph, the Mail, we got the dietary fat guidelines wrong, they shouldn't have been introduced, butter is not bad for us after all. It reached Time Magazine, Sydney Morning Herald and New Zealand. And all of those headlines came from the first major paper from my PhD. And it essentially said, if you look at the evidence pyramid, at the top of the evidence pyramid, you have what's called a systematic review, no cherry picking, you go through all the evidence, and you pull it together in a technique called meta-analysis, and the best trials that you can do that to are randomized controlled trials. So that was the absolute best evidence available, and the unique aspect of that paper was that it went back to when the dietary guidelines were set, in 1977 in the US, in 1983 in the UK, and it said if we had that technique of meta-analysis now, what would the evidence have shown? And the evidence showed that there was no difference whatsoever between putting people on any dietary fat intervention that you could choose and any impact on all-cause mortality or coronary heart disease mortality. The other secondary finding from that paper, which is why I think it caught the attention of the world, was that those trials combined, there are only six trials, and they involve fewer than two and a half thousand sick men, men who had already had a heart attack. No women were studied, no healthy people were studied, and yet we changed dietary guidelines for 300 million Americans. That became the 64th most impactful paper of 2015 in any discipline, whether that's global warming, education or whatever. That is how interested people are in nutrition, and that is how much they want us to get it right. 
So the first paper you've just seen, I was pleasantly surprised the speed at which Public Health England said, OK, the evidence wasn't there at the time, but the evidence is there now. Well, that surprised me because the second paper from our team was ready to go and it brought the evidence up to date and it said, OK, we're not now back in 1983, we're here in 2016. What does all the available evidence today show? And similarly, it showed that there was no evidence whatsoever for introducing those guidelines. For completeness, population studies, as Asima said, are not as powerful as evidence, but for completeness, let's look at the population studies to see what they say. No evidence at the time, no evidence today. So if you want to read one of the papers on the reference slides, that's the one. It's basically my PhD in one paper on open view. And it concludes that there was simply no evidence at the time or now to introduce those two dietary fat guidelines. Now, you don't just have to take my word for it, because that final paper, as it should do, looked at the other researchers who had looked at exactly the same topic. And there were seven teams, and we were just one of those. And they'd been going since about 2009. And across those seven teams, there were 40 separate findings where they'd looked at either mortality or cardiovascular disease or events for total fat, saturated fat, swapping one fat for another fat. 40 different findings from those seven teams. Only three found anything against any fat. Now, why is it not being screamed from the rooftops that 37 results from seven independent teams found nothing? We need to stop demonising fat. Of the three findings, one was against trans fats. You'll get no argument from me on that one. Ban them. And two were from the same team. They essentially went back to revisit their own result. It was the Hooper team. They found an association between cardiovascular disease events and saturated fat intake, swapping it for unsaturated fat intake. And I'm indebted to Trudy. I always credit Dr. Trudy Deacon for this one. Trudy managed to sift through the 200-odd page paper and to realise when that was subjected to a sensitivity test, even those findings, those two repeated findings, fell away. So there is nothing against total or saturated fat, and nothing for any of those conditions. Mortality, coronary heart disease, myocardial infarctions, that's heart attacks, strokes, non-fatal heart attacks, nothing for any of them. So you would think, would you not, that when the, I have to call this the Eat Badly Guide, or the... <laughs> put it in inverted commas at least because this is so not the way to eat healthily. When this was reintroduced, it was the Eat Badly Plate, it became the Eat Badly Guide in March 2016. You would think that Public Health England would have moved dramatically away from demonising fat and then of course you would be wrong because they put together these sections of their new plate and I like to think I've analysed this plate more than anyone else in the UK. If you know anyone who's done it more than me, let me know because I want to shake their hand. But what happens, this is all by portion size on the plate. So it's by volume, it's by weight. And when you assign a calorie intake to it, because these approximate to 400 calories per 100 grams, these are tiny, nearer 50, this ends up being 62% of your calorie intake. The vegetables and fruits, just 8%. Dairy, how essential for bones, calcium and so on, just 6%, the most healthy section on the whole plate where there's a little bit of meat but they try not to emphasise it, 11%, junk, you can't take junk off the plate surely, 9% and then you've got the fats and spreads, 4%. And they published some menus at the time, so I went through all of those menus in great detail and I found that the plate had moved even further from those macronutrients of 15, 30, and 55. Protein was at about 19%, fat was at about 16%, and carb had become, on average across the menu, 65% of your calorie intake. Some days the carb intake was as high as 70% of the diet, 375 grams of carbohydrate a day. Unsurprisingly, that diet is nutritionally deficient, particularly in the fat-soluble vitamins, because you're just not eating fat. So it was deficient in retinol, a quarter of what we need. Vitamin D, a quarter of what we need. Also deficient in vitamin E and calcium. And the EAT diet that was published earlier on this year, within two hours of opening the paper, I published a blog showing that it was deficient again in the fat-soluble vitamins, iron, calcium, and the essential fatty acids. So diabetes, if you sum up diabetes <coughs> in one sentence, either type, 
It is the inability to handle carbohydrate. It's basically the body saying, you've had too much carbohydrate too often, I just can't cope with getting it out of the bloodstream any longer. So the Public Health England advice is essentially a recipe for diabetes. And why might that be? Well, would it surprise you to know that those organisations are just a tiny few of the organisations represented by the people on the panel? Public Health England put together the panel that was going to design that Eat Badly guide. There were 11 reps, only nine turned up regularly. Only one of those had no conflicts of interest. Five were representatives of these organisations. So those companies at the back there are just some of the members of one of those organisations, the British Nutrition Foundation. We don't have all the others from the British Retail Consortium Institute of Grocery Distribution and so on. My final slide. People here sat before you today, and I think we can probably speak on behalf of Tom as well. We're asking for three things. We're saying, please don't base the guidelines on the one macronutrient that we don't need and the one macronutrient that diabetics can't handle. Please don't allow the fake food industry to set our guidelines. As Professor Capel says, it's like putting Dracula in charge of the blood bank. And please give patients choice. There are three evidence-based ways. Remember the final slide, the evidence is on that slide. Three evidence-based ways to reverse or put it into remission. Bariatric surgery, unfortunately, is one of them. Low-calorie diets are another, and low-carb diets are another. And give patients at least the choice between the two dietary options, even if you don't want to offer them bariatric surgery. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Zoe. Thank you.